It's choosing where you really want your money to go. And once you have that mindset of like, you saying yes to one thing is saying no to something else. And I, I wanna say yes to things that I really care about. And I wanna say yes to the life that I want. And that perspective makes it so much easier to say no to things that you don't care about. I used to say yes to everything. Hi, everybody, and welcome to another episode of the Smarter Money Show. My name is Vlad Sherbogov, and today our special guest, she is a financial coach and the creator of a very popular personal finance blog called Clo Bear. And in less than two years, she managed to not only pay off over $40,000 in debt, but on top of that, also save $150,000. Today, she coaches other people on how to make money work for them. And she's followed by thousands of fans throughout social media. Please welcome Chloe Daniels. Hello. Thank you so much for having me today. Chloe, thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us. You started your journey in 2018. Can you talk about what was happening in your life at the time and what urged you in that direction? In 2018, when I got a new job, I had kind of recognized like, okay, I've been getting promoted every year. I've been making more money every year. And yet I'm still living paycheck to paycheck for the most part. I really haven't saved anything for retirement. I haven't saved an emergency fund. I haven't really done anything. And I, I say that I value things like travel and experiences, yet I don't have any opportunity to save any money and I don't have any opportunity to prioritize that. So when I got this new job, I was transferring out of the nonprofit industry and into the corporate world working as a consultant. And it was a very significant pay increase. I think I went from like making maybe $67,000 a year to $91,000 a year. And so it was a big jump. And I was like, okay, I feel like I could probably become debt free if I really just paid attention to where my money was going. Because at the time I had about $70,000 in student loan debt. And I didn't even know what the interest rate was, but I found out the interest rate was like 8.88 something percent, which is extremely high for student loans. And so I was like, well, okay, let me just track where my money goes for two weeks and see what I'm actually spending my money on at the end of the day. And I was horrified. I was like spending $600 every two weeks on eating out, drinking, being hungover, and like just random things. And I was like, if I'm doing that every two weeks, and let's say that's $1,200 a month and I'm just blowing on things that I wouldn't say I give high value to, but where our money goes is really, it shows where our values are. And so I decided, okay, I'm going to get on a budget. I'm going to start telling my money where to go. I don't know what I'm doing, but I'll figure it out as I go. And I had already been writing on Clobear for a couple of years, but it wasn't money related at all. It was all just like relationships, mental health, personal growth, those kind of things. And I was like, well, I really want to get my, my money together. And that's just as important as things like mental health, like those go hand in hand. And so I decided, you know what, I'm just going to start writing about my budget every month. I'm going to share my budget. I'm going to share what I did wrong. I'm going to share what went well. And it's just kind of, that's how it started. And from there, I think a lot of people start their journey off trying to become debt free because that's like an easy win. You don't really understand how to invest at that point. You don't really understand how to build wealth. So you just think, man, if I was debt free, I'd be in a better financial situation. But as I learned more and more, I was like, I don't just want to be debt free. Like I also want to build wealth. I don't want to just start at zero and be like debt free. I want to focus on how can I invest and how can I someday retire early? And so that's when I kind of stumbled into the financial independence retire early community and it just kind of like snowballed from there it was like you learn a little bit more and then you want to learn a little bit more and then you want to learn a little bit more right. and so now a little over two years later it's definitely snowballed in something big and now i'm teaching other people how to do it too when you were going through that career shift it mm -hmm. was almost just a coincidence or that as you were trying to figure out what am i going to do with this extra money that i'm about to make you you realized yeah. what your existing lifestyle was and is that when you thought, oh, wait a minute, it's not just the income surplus that's that's the solution here. There, there's a different problem here. Well, yeah, because I knew that if I didn't start paying attention, I would just keep living paycheck to paycheck. I would end up spending all of that money. I knew because I had proven that to myself. Here I was, everything I started out in 20. 
15, I started out making $41,000 a year and I made at least $10,000 more every year until 2018, if not more. And I was like, I'm still blowing through all of that money. I'm not, I'm not saving anymore. Every time I'd get a raise or a promotion, I'd be like, oh, now I can finally save some money or pay off my debt. And then it was just like, I never got to that point. So I knew that if I was making $91,000 a year, I would either spend it all because I still wasn't paying attention to it and like let that lifestyle creep sink in, or I could actually pay attention to it and decide, okay, where do I actually want my money to go? So I was really like, I don't want to just constantly be on this hamster wheel of spending more and more and more as I make more and more and more. And it's like, no, I want to get into a better place. And so I think for me, it was realizing I could be making six figures and still spending, you know, I think there's a, there's a statistic out there that 24% of people who make over a hundred thousand dollars a year still live paycheck to paycheck. Mm -hmm. And it's like, I don't want to do that. I want to figure out how to make my money work for me. So once you realize I need to start tracking and I need to start improving, but as you said yourself, you didn't really know what to Mm -hmm. do. You just wanted to figure it out. What happened next? What did you do? Yeah. So I started reading a lot of blogs and that's kind of how I discovered the personal finance community, but also more importantly, the FIRE community, the financial independence retire early community. So I started out with reading the JL Collins stock series. I started reading Millennial Revolution and started like learning how these people were doing it. And when I started reading their journeys, I was so jealous. I was like, oh my gosh, it's so cool that they get to do this. Like the Millennial Revolution couple, they retired in their thirties and have been traveling the world ever since. And it's like, Oh, that's so cool. That's something I want to do. And I, I really believe that when you're jealous of something, the reason is because you want to be doing that. It's a very good indicator that that is something that you feel drawn towards. And so I was like, for a while, I was like, "Ah, I couldn't do that. Like, I don't know how to invest. Like, that's not for me. Like, you know, I just want to be debt free and then I'll figure out everything else. And then the more I thought about it, I was like, they can do it. I can do it. There's no reason I can't do this too. So from there, it was just like, all right, I'm going to learn how to do this. I'm going to learn how to do this with the budgeting thing. It was kind of, I was mostly self-taught with the budgeting thing. I had tried Dave Ramsey before. I'm not a fan of Dave Ramsey at all. I had tried his envelope method because that was all I had heard of in the past. And that never worked for me because it was so general, so vague, and I didn't like using cash. And so I started just kind of experimenting and What I learned was that if it was something that I wanted to pay attention to, like drinking and eating out and spending money on those things, then I needed a category for it. I needed to keep track of it because if I could keep track of it in a way, I could kind of control it. But I also wanted to make sure I was making it a priority to put money in places that I really cared about. So I made sure I was spending money on travel. I was spending money on paying off debt. I was spending money on investing. So it was kind of like the categories just formed out of the priorities that are in my life. But I didn't really learn that method from anyone in particular. It was just a lot of trial and error. And once you had those categories, how did you adjust your lifestyle to get you onto that path of getting out of debt? I stopped eating out a lot. Like I used to eat out multiple times a weekend where you're like going to brunch and then you're going out at night and all of those things. And for me, having more of an awareness of it it made budgeting and my life, it, it just kind of combined them together because I was now more mindful of my money. And now I had a plan. I knew that if I stuck to this plan, if I stuck to this budget, I could be debt free or I could, you know, retire early someday. So knowing that and knowing like this is getting me closer to my ideal life, this is getting me closer to my goals, made it so much easier to stick to a budget because before when I was budgeting with the envelope method, I didn't really know why I was budgeting. It was just kind of like, yeah, I'm supposed to be good with money. This is what you're supposed to do as an adult. Where I was like, I got really clear on why I wanted to do this. So it gave, it was a lot easier for me to say no to things. It was a lot easier for me to decide to pass up going out to brunch and like offer another solution, say like, let's have breakfast here or let's do those things. So I think in the way that it changed, I stopped eating out a lot. I stopped drinking out a lot and I just started making suggestions that were free. So it's like my friends, I've never had a friend say, like when I've made a suggestion to do something free, I've never had somebody say, oh yeah, I I hate saving money. Like, no, I don't want to do that. Like (laughs) every, usually if you offer a free suggestion, I've noticed your friends are like relieved because I think everyone is trying to save money, even in the back of their conscience. Everyone likes saving money if that becomes an option. But I think a lot of people, their go-to is like, let's go do something, not Mm. what can we do to like, that's still hanging out, still together and, and free. 
were you worried that you would like appear as if you're cheap or something or, 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 you know, not cool anymore because suddenly you just don't want to go anywhere and spend and spend money yeah. or is that just not reality? I think in my earlier, like when I first started off, I thought it was going to be a tough adjustment because I had a few friends who were very bougie, who were very like, they love going out to the newest things. They don't care. They use their credit card for everything. They go into credit card debt. And at first it was definitely uncomfortable because I was like, man, they're not going to invite me to stuff anymore, or they're not going to want to hang out with me because I'm not going to want to like spend the way that they want to spend. And what I've learned is that the people who are bothered by that and the people who don't want to hang out with me because of that, that's really a reflection of them. And ultimately it's not really the kind of people I want to surround myself with. So I did lose some friends, but it was friends that I really didn't feel connected to anyway. We had different values. So it was like, those were my friends who were like, let's go out on the town kind of people. But I have changed since then. Like now I don't try to keep up with the Chicago scene. I'm much more low key. I prefer staying in. I prefer doing things for free. I prefer going outside. I prefer like, you know, those types of things. And I don't care about keeping up with the latest restaurants anymore. So if I don't have a lot of friends who are really focused on that and my friends who my good friends, and that's another thing too, is the older I've gotten, the less friends I have, the more I'm focused on the quality of friendships rather than, you know, just having a bunch of friends to, you know, go out to restaurants with. So my friends know all of this about me. Obviously I'm very open about my passion for personal finance and my budget, but I also make it a priority that when it's a special occasion, like I'm going to be there, I'm going to do the thing, but it's like differentiating. Oh, let's just go to this new restaurant just because, and this isn't actually a special occasion. Like that differentiating between those two things has been really important. And what I found too, is that my close friends, They like doing the same things I like doing. They Mm. like having dinner at home. They like cooking together. They like just hanging out and watching a movie. They like going for walks and things like that. So I feel like this journey has actually improved my friendships and made me closer to the people who have similar values or at the very least love me for who I am. And that doesn't bother them that I don't want to necessarily do things that take a lot of money if if I'm not really into it. If I'm really into it, if it's something I'm really excited about, I'll totally spend money on it. Yeah, it definitely was a shift in my boundaries with friends. Financial health is, is a lifestyle, right? Yeah. Similar to physical health or mental health as well. Like it, it's something that happens on a consistent basis and people that are around you are so important, mm-hmm. right? So, and it's sometimes the payout is a little bit later as well. So mm-hmm. some, some of those fancy places, yeah, maybe you skipped on it a, a few times now, but I'm sure that you have plans in your early retirement phase where you're going to make up for it, right? it's choosing where you really want your money to go and once you have that mindset of like you saying yes to one thing is saying no to something else and like i want to say yes to myself i want to say yes to things that i really care about and i want to say yes to the life that i want and that perspective makes it so much easier to say no to things that you don't care about i used to say yes to everything every time my friend wanted to go to a new opening or a show or a new restaurant or a concert or all of those things. It didn't matter if I I didn't care about that show or I didn't care about going to that. It was just like, yeah, I'll go. Yeah, I'll go. Yeah. I I used to live in China before this. So I used to live in Wuhan, China and I moved to Chicago and I was so excited to be around my friends again that I just wanted to say yes to everything. So for it took me a couple of years of that to come to this place of like in 2018 where I realized this isn't actually bringing me closer to the life that I want to live. Like, I'm so glad I have these friends, but now I want to focus less on just having a bunch of friends and focusing more on like the quality of my friendships and making sure that, you know, we have similar goals, similar values and want to do similar things. So once you got onto that track and you started tracking things and you started adjusting your lifestyle a bit within those categories to make room for paying up debt, right? And get you close to your goals. Can you tell me uh, like how long did it take and how much we're able to put away now and how long did it take you to pay off that 40K in debt? But you said you also had student debt. Yeah, so that's part of the student debt. So when I started out, I was focusing mostly on paying my debt off like 100%. That's what I wanted more than anything. But my plan has shifted in those years. So I'm no longer focused on being debt free. That doesn't really appeal to me anymore because my student loan interest rates at 3.54%. So to me, I'd rather be investing and making money in the market rather than paying that student loan off. So I paid off $40,000 in about two years that I reduced my interest rate down to 3.54%. And then in terms of investing, I didn't start heavily investing until about 
I would say at the beginning of 2020. So it's been about a year and a half now. When I started the debt-free journey, I increased my 401k contributions. I think I was, at the time I was only getting 3% and like I was meeting the match. So I increased that, I believe to 10% at first, um, just because I didn't want to, I didn't want to have that money available to me. Like I wanted to make sure it was just getting put away. I didn't have to worry about it. And I didn't really understand my options at that time. So I was like, this is my easiest thing to do. I'm just going to do this. And then, you know, I'm just going to focus on debt. But after I did that, I spent about a year and a half, I want to say, focusing just on becoming debt free. So I put $2,000 a month on my debt every single month. That shifted in 2020 because in that time where I was focused on becoming debt free, I was also spending a lot of time learning about personal finance and getting really into it because I had to come to this realization that I'm responsible for my future. No one else is responsible for my future. And there's no rich husband coming to save me. There's no rich aunt or uncle coming to give me an inheritance. Like I have to figure this stuff out. And so realizing that really shifted me into a mindset of like, I need to learn as much as possible. And one thing would just lead me to the next thing. And so then in 2000, I shifted from this, I want to be debt free mindset to, I want to build wealth as quickly as possible mindset. And so I knew I needed to start investing. So I spent several months learning how to invest. And that's what led me to, you know, index fund investing, ETF investing, things like that. Um, And so from there, I pushed up my 401k contributions to max out. So to put that full $19,500. And then I also started investing in real estate. So I am a private money lender for a contractor here in Chicago that does flips. Um, which is not an investing mode that I recommend for most people. It's very risky. It's very stressful sometimes, but I knew this person, I knew they were doing it. I had seen them be successful at it and I trusted them. So I started investing in their company and I made quite a bit of money very quickly doing that. Um, And so that really helped blow up my portfolio as well. Um, But in that year and a half that I've been investing, I did 401k, my IRA. And then when the market was down last year in March, 2020, I like, and it was very down. I increased my contributions to my 401k to 25% because I really wanted to see that growth. And that helped me out a lot. I ended up making quite a bit of money in my 401k last year just from doing that. But yeah, it's just been those small steps. I mean, I didn't, you know, didn't hit big with like buying a particular stock when it was down. I don't focus on that. I really focus on long-term investing. Um, My riskiest investments, obviously with the private money lending with the contractor, but for the most part, I just focus on index funds and index ETFs. And you, you were employed during this time as well, right? Yes, I'm still employed. And you are still now. So how are you managing? I think a recurring theme that I'm hearing is there's a lot of self-education that you've done for yourself. Lots of lots of reading the blogs, and uh, as you have your full time job, you're doing all this learning on the side. You're making these money moves. You're improving your situation. You're even looking into alternative sources of income, such as becoming a private lender, which is a complex topic and something that can be intimidating for somebody who doesn't know that industry well to get mm-hmm. into. How are you able to manage your full time job and all these extracurricular um, activities Great that question. were that, that were coming together? <laughs> Yeah. So I didn't start financial coaching until a year ago. So I, it was in June last year where I actually started my side business. I had been doing my blogging for several years, so that hadn't changed. I think the blog kept me accountable for my learning because the more I got into it and the more I shared these things, the more people had questions and they wanted answers from me. It was just kind of like, okay, this is what people are asking for. I need to spend time researching this so I can share information about this from my perspective, which is what people want. And so I think having the blog has made it a lot easier to continue my education because I have people who want to hear from me. I have people who want my opinion on different things. And so that's been really good from an education standpoint. Personal finance is my passion. So it's what I spend all of my free time doing. Like there's that quote, whatever it is that you spend all of your free time doing, like that's what you should be doing for your job. Like I, in my free time, watch YouTube videos on personal finance. In my free time, I'm reading blogs. In my free time, like I am obsessed with personal finance. And I'm obsessed with learning the things that I don't know because personal finance and financial literacy is so important. And there are so 
we have so much work to do. <laughs> we have so much work to do in getting people up to speed on their own personal finances and just being able to understand the complex systems that are out there. So that passion really drives me and it moves me to keep going. And the more popular Clobear became, the more I am held accountable by the people who follow me and the more I want to show up for them. So I think that Clobear has been a huge priority. It is hard balancing it though. So I have a nine to five job. I have a relationship. I have Clobear. I have financial coaching. I have all of these different things. And time management has been very important. I am very type A, like I have my planner literally right here where every hour of my day is pretty much scheduled out. It's not so strict towards like, if something happens, I can't flex, like I'm flexible, but like generally I have to keep a planner. I have to keep a really strict calendar. I have to do all of these things to make sure that I'm using my time wisely. And what I've learned recently because of the popularity of Clobear and how many clients, Clobear really exploded in the last three months. Like I think three months ago, I had probably 2,500 followers, maybe now I'm up to 1,100 followers and almost 10,000 on TikTok. And so it's just been the last three months where it's really exploded. And so I've had to really adjust in terms of time management and figure out, okay, how do I do all of this? Because it's a lot. Um, and what I've learned is for me, I have to at least have one night a week to myself where I don't have to do anything Clover related. I don't have to do anything, you know, relationship wise. I don't, I'm not spending time with my friends. I'm just focusing on I need to clean the house. Like I need to like relax. I need to exercise. I need to do those things. So I think having that kind of balance is something that I'm always working on. I feel like balance is such an elusive thing. Everybody's like, how do we achieve more balance? Nobody ever has real balance. Like we're always just trying to figure it out. And so for me, balance for me right now is making sure I at least have one night a week to myself where I can just exist um, and do things that are relaxing and kind of reset for the week. And that's going to be even more important as I start. I start my I'm getting my CFP, so my Certified Financial Planner Certificate. I am starting a course to study for that uh, in July. So that's going to be even more things that I've got to start juggling. That's fantastic. And and I'm I'm really happy to to hear that because I think that social media as a whole has become a tremendous platform for Mm -hmm. financial conversations and money conversations. Things Mm -hmm. like, you know, Instagram had been for a while, but TikTok in particular has been so surprising as this blend of um, you know engagement and information. The danger side of it, however, is the quality of information. So for me personally, I love people that are on TikTok that have some professional background, whether it's from you know financial industry or whatever it may be, or are actively involved in it, or at least are aware of it. So so that things like false representations or promises or guarantees or you know language is very important when it comes to financial matters, right? So to me, I've loved seeing the growth of uh, financial conversation on social media because that leads to more awareness uh, of financial literacy. It leads to more motivation of people asking questions about their their financial habits. And normalizing it too. It's definitely like, it's not normal to talk about finances anymore. Or And I feel like the conversations that are happening on Instagram and TikTok are normalizing it. And I would agree too, just in terms of the at the flip side, there's a lot of scammers out there. Well, it's so easy to look rich on Instagram. It is so easy to look rich on TikTok. And you think that, oh, because this person is standing in front of a Lamborghini, they're rich. And so I should listen to their advice. And a lot of those times, the people who are acting rich are not. They're living in their parents' house. They're living in their parents' basement. They're trading really, really risky things. They have no liabilities. They don't have anything to worry about. So it's, you really have to do your due diligence and research on your own as well, because you never know on the internet, like what kind of information you're hearing. So cross check it with other influencers, cross check it with all of these other creators to make sure that the information that you're getting is actually accurate because there are a lot of scams out there. Oh, you're absolutely right. And some people may even do it unintentionally, you know, like even if somebody's not trying to scam, just not having that professional background sometimes or education, you may make some mistakes that even if you are doing everything in good faith, you're just not sure how to communicate. So I think I think that's really good for you to, to and responsible to take those extra steps to continue educating yourself and not just go in for that viral factor. No, and that's why I wanted to do it is because it is such a touchy situation. And obviously in all of my posts, I make it very clear that I'm not a CFP. I'm not a financial advisor. You need to do your own research because 
there's things I don't know. There's things that I'm constantly learning and I'm very actively learning things on my platform. So like I try to only talk about, and I do only talk about the things that I know about, but I want to continue to expand that. And I also want to legitimize it so that I know I'm giving you the best advice or giving you the best information that I can possibly give you. So to me, I was like, you know, I could have gotten my license and um, selling financial products and things like that, but that didn't really make sense like your series. And I was like, the, the creme de la creme is the CFP. So I'm just going to get the CFP. And I feel like that's going to give me the most robust knowledge. And then from there, obviously, I'll continue learning as well. So I know people who have been in the industry for years and years and years, and they're learning all the time, too, because things are changing all of the time. Absolutely. You mentioned something that I thought was interesting, and that is the fact that social media, in a sense, is normalizing some of these conversations because it's not... Uh, so common to hear them. And what I find interesting is that even happens like in households, right? And between couples. And you mentioned that even on your blog, you used to write about relationships as well. I'm not, I'm not sure if you still do. And you're currently in a relationship and you are, and personal finance is your passion. And usually it it bleeds through in, into other parts of your life when you're really passionate about something. I'm curious to get your thoughts on what is the role of finance and money in relationships between couples. Oh, it's so important. Being on the same page financially with your partner is just one of the, I would say the most important thing. I mean, 50% of marriages are still ending and most of the time it's because of money. And that's the, one of the biggest stressors in relationships. So to me, being on the same page, your, your finances are tied to everything that you do. It's, there's no escaping it. We live in a world where your finances are tied to literally everything that you do. So if you and your partner are not on the same page financially and can't get on the same page, like you can get on the same page financially, but you have to be able to have those open conversations. But if you have tried to have those conversations, you've tried to see things from the same viewpoint, you tried to have the same goals, the same values, and it's still, you're still not on the same page financially. That's it's to me, this might be extreme. That's just a doomed relationship. I mean, you're always going to be butting heads on those things. You're never going to feel that support. Where I was talking about the friends things earlier, it's even more important that the person that you're with isn't constantly blowing money gambling, isn't constantly wanting to go out to the hottest restaurants and isn't constantly, you know, wanting to YOLO all of their money away. You have to be able to come to sign some kind of an agreement or some kind of middle ground. If you can't come to that middle ground, then it's just, to me, it's not going to work. It's going to be stressful. It's going to, you're never going to be able to achieve your goals because this person is constantly keeping you under or vice versa. Being able to have those open money conversations is really important. My relationship, particularly, we are a relatively new relationship. We haven't combined finances or anything. We're not planning on doing that. And probably I will never combine finances with somebody who I marry just because I like the autonomy. I like having that separate situation. But, you know, he's new. He hasn't been entrenched in the finance world that I have been in. But at the same time, we have very similar values. He's not super bougie. He's not going out every week and he's not wanting to blow all of his paycheck. He's open to learning and he also wants to save those things. So it's like, you don't necessarily have to be on the same page financially when you meet and when you're developing that relationship, but you have to have the same values. You have to have the same wants. You have to have the same goals and they have to at least in some way be aligned. They don't have to be exactly the same, but like there has to be some kind of a crossover so that you can come to the table and have a discussion about what you both want so that both of your needs and both of your values and both of those things that you want out of life are, you know, coming together and you're able to be compatible. So I think that if you're not financially compatible, that's just an uphill battle. You're right. And I mean, relationships are based a lot of times on things that are common interests, right, that you want to give each other support for. And if you look at it, if you ask a couple, hey, you know, what do you guys like doing? A lot of times you'll hear things like, oh, we like to eat out at different restaurants. We like to walk on the beach. We like big families. So we like children, right? Like you have to have those common things. But money, in a sense, is usually brought up in a negative connotation, right? Like there's something something is, is negative happening because of money. But what if you have two people that are very passionate about personal finance, very passionate about the, tracking their own uh, money behavior, right? And use it as, as a common interest. Uh, you yeah. don't hear too much. Like, I don't think I've ever heard anything like that before. Oh, yeah. They need to have like a financial independence retire early dating app. because. they? Because we're the people who are in the fire community are so similar. We view the world from similar standpoints. There's obviously varying degrees on the fire community scale, but it's just 
meeting somebody that would make so many things so much easier because not only do you have to go into a new relationship and, and you know more about money possibly but you also have to explain this theory of fire <laughs> people yeah. look at you like you're crazy um if you are somebody who is passionate about personal finance i put that on my dating profile i make it very clear that i'm passionate about personal finance i'm on the fire journey because to me that's like the most important thing in my life right now because it's tied to everything else that i do i don't know if i've ever seen and i i was single for a while so i i don't know if i ever saw on anybody's profile financial independence retire early or really into personal finance i don't know if people think that it's like oh she's a gold digger or oh she you know she's all, only into money it's like no, no no i'm quite the opposite like i oh. am figuring it all out for myself so i the reason i put it on my profile is because i like i want to make it clear like we're going to talk about money sure. <laughs> and there's nothing wrong with that right yeah, absolutely, absolutely. I, I want to go back to the, the time when you decided to take a look and you had that revelation about uh, about your financial situation and i think that is a crucial point for a lot of people because for a lot of people it just doesn't happen right you're just living paycheck to paycheck as you go on and that can go on for decades and a lot of times the situation is even worse where you are in unmanageable debt and you're not sure how to get out of it. Even if you did take a look at your budget or your spending, it's just, it's too overwhelming to do anything about it, right? And it'll just significantly change your lifestyle. So I'm curious, you've helped a lot of people already take a look at their finances from a different perspective and take steps towards it. Mm -hmm. How do you get people to not only understand their situation, but motivate them to take those steps and spend even a week um, with an adjusted lifestyle so that you can start that snowball effect right. right, and make it an ethic. Yeah. I think a big part of it is a lot of people don't know their why a lot of people don't think about their future in the same way that we think about like growing a business, at least in what I've seen in the clients that I've had, the people who have had the hardest time are the people who aren't really clear on why they're doing it getting really clear on that takes a lot of inner work. It takes a lot of reflection. It takes a lot of thinking about what is actually important to me, other than what society tells me should be important to me. How do I know what I really, really want? And the thing is a lot of people don't know what they really, really want. And picturing your dream life can be really difficult for a lot of people because either they don't think it's achievable, they think that it's not something that they can do and getting over that hurdle of, what you think you can achieve and what is actually possible or, or what you've told yourself is possible is a big hurdle to get over. So there's a lot of inner work that has to take place. I have tons of clients who never would have thought of seeing a financial coach before, but the reason that they did is because they one post got to them and they decided to start following me. And then they start seeing these other posts that like resonate with them. And slowly but surely they're like, huh, maybe, maybe I could actually do this. Maybe it is possible. I mean, she did it and she didn't know anything about it. So I think that the reason that I have been successful is because of my transparency and my empathy and saying like, I have been where you are. I get it. I know what it's like to feel like retirement's not an option for you. Like you're always going to have to work. Like you're always going to live paycheck to paycheck. And it is possible and you don't have to scam your way into it and you don't have to join an MLM. You don't have to do any of these gross things that I think a lot of us think like, oh, I have to like do this with my finances. Like we don't, you don't have to do that. It is simple. It is not as difficult as we think it is. And you can do hard things. So I feel like it's a little bit of that of just like getting exposed and like slowly dipping your toe in the water until you see something that just really resonates with you. And it's like, those posts, they just, they slowly chip away at you. You start to get like, oh, she did it. Oh, that other person did it. Oh, okay. And once you start entrenching yourself into the world, it becomes more normal. And you start to feel like it's not as difficult to achieve financial independence as I think it is. I think that when you're outside of the space, let's say you've never followed a personal finance person, you've never thought about finances, you haven't even heard of Dave Ramsey, like all of this, when you're out of that world, it's such a foreign concept to you. But once you start stepping in the door, and you start seeing more and more people doing it and more and more people talking about it and you start sharing those things and your friends start sharing those things it just becomes this compounding effect where it's like oh no no and this is more normal than i think it is like it's not extraordinary it's actually something that i can achieve so i don't know does that make sense absolutely and uh, I, I think you're touching on something that even you yourself did which is you uh, when you first started your blog and you started sharing 
your own spending, your tracking, you, you make it public, you, you put it down, that becomes a great motivator. That social contract in general is a tremendous motivator for people to do all kinds of things. You can be on and off with a boyfriend or girlfriend for 10 years, for you know, a year and 10 times in, in a year. But once you put that status uh, official that you guys are off, on Facebook or something like that. You, you've made that social contract and now you right. have to live up to it. Right. We live in such an algorithm-based world now. So your TikTok is based off of what content you're already engaging in. Your Instagram is based off of the content you're already engaging in. Facebook, same thing. It's until you take a step outside of your community that you've already set for yourself, you don't know that there's this huge personal finance community that's actually interesting, actually relatable, actually filled with good advice and actually can help you achieve those things. But as soon as you take that one step in just following somebody or just liking a post that has to do with personal finance, then it's like you're exposed to so much more. I, I keep thinking of the TikTok trend where you like open a door and you're entering in this new universe. And it's like, it's that way. It is really right. that way where you're like, oh, it's like this light bulb switch in your brain where it's like all these things you had no idea were possible are actually possible. And here are all of these people who are going to help you reach whatever it is you want to do. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And when you talk to your different students and people that use your services and try to learn and follow your footsteps in some ways, what are some of the biggest mistakes that you see people make that you try to address from the beginning? What are some of those early things that you feel people benefit from the most? Yeah, I think a lot of people have the same issue that I had in that they just have no idea where their money is going every month. They don't understand how to keep track of it. I think that the idea of tracking what you spend is so foreign for most people. People track their calories, people track their food. But when you hear tracking your money, it sounds so odd and weird. And like, why would I track my money? And it's like, well, how, how will you know where your money's going if you're not paying attention to where it's going? And so I think that that for most of my clients has been a huge game changer is just spending some time tracking your spending and seeing what you're actually spending things on. It helps you shift out of this like, oh, this is just money is a thing that comes in and out of my life and I don't have a lot of control over it to money is something that is a tool and it's something that I get to decide where it goes um, if I just pay attention to it. So that to me has been very huge for a lot of my clients. Uh, at the same time, a lot of my clients don't like tracking things and don't like mm -hmm. having restrictive budgets. So even if you don't plan on having a budget, which you don't need a budget to succeed and you don't need a budget to become financially independent, but having that practice for at least a couple of weeks or a couple of months of doing the tracking to help get that muscle into shape, I think has been very helpful for a lot of clients. And then I'd say the other big problem that I see is, I mean, that's the hugest one is just not knowing what's coming in and not what, knowing what's going out. Um, but the other one is spending more than what you make. I have a lot of, and that that's tied, that's very similar to the same thing that I just talked about. But when I have clients who are spending consistently every single month more than what they make, that is a much harder conversation because right. it's, we have to cut back drastically just to get you to spend what you're spending. I think that that for a lot of my clients has been a huge wake up call to realize mm -hmm. every month I'm spending more than what I make sometimes by thousands of dollars and having that conversation of you have to stop the bleed or else you're going to be in so much debt, it's going to be impossible for you to get out of it. And having that conversation is always very difficult because the only option is make more money and spend less. Like those are the only two options. And most of the time it's a combination. You need to make more money and you also need to spend less in order to get out of that habit of just bleeding money and not knowing where it's going. So besides that, I would also say credit card debt is a big one. A lot of people have credit card debt. A lot of people feel shame about the credit card debt. And a lot of people feel that shame prevents them from looking at their finances and, just, and getting a full picture. So I do see a lot of clients who have anxiety around that. And that's where I think coaching is extremely valuable because you're with them on this journey and that's what they need. They need somebody who is there with them, facing this with them and looking at their entire financial picture together and saying, okay, we did the hard part. We saw where we're at. This is the worst it's going to be. Now we need to make a plan to get out of this and to, right. to move forward. So I would say that's just getting that full financial picture for a lot of people. It's a very emotional experience. It is a tough experience. It is not something anybody wants to do by themselves. 
uh, or at least not that a lot of my clients don't want to do it by themselves and doing it together and talking through it. It's like a weight lifted, even though it's scary. And a lot of the times people see how bad it is and they're terrified. It's also this weight lifted because you're no longer in the dark. You're no longer wondering what your financial situation is going to be. And instead you're taking a look and saying like, okay, this is where I'm at. And now I got to get better. And that difference between knowing and not knowing is huge. And there are a lot of feelings involved. Like mm -hmm. there are a lot of feelings involved in financial health. And mm -hmm. you have, you mentioned financial coaches, which is a very different thing in my mind from a financial advisor, which a lot of people will never even think about a financial advisor, even if they make well into the six figures. Because like you said, they uh, may be living still paycheck to paycheck. I know all about that. It's, it's just your lifestyle changes. There are feelings from the very beginning that, like you said, it could be anxiety, it could be shame, it could be embarrassment when you are in debt, when you are feeling pressure to spend on things because of maybe social expectations or peer pressure and things like that or different events. And you seem like you're in a never-ending hole that you just can't climb out of. You're too scared to analyze your own situation, let alone take uh, meaningful actions to correct it. You speak very openly and intimately on your blog about uh, mental health, about um, struggles that you went through personally as well. And of course, mental health is an extremely complicated subject and it touches all aspects of life and it's not just related to, to finance. And yet finance is a very much impact on our mental health and our physical health as a result as well. So I'm curious to learn from you, is regaining control of your finances, did it help and did it have a positive impact on your thinking and your outlook on life in general? hundred percent. I mean, I have gone to therapy and I've gone to therapy over the years and many different types of therapists and things like that. I've been on medication before I've done all of those things. Getting my finances together has probably been the single most powerful thing to getting my mental health and my physical health and my, all of those things together because there's this sense of security the second that you have an emergency fund. There's a sense of security every time that you know you get to put away some of your paycheck. You don't have to just spend all of your paycheck. There's a sense of security knowing that if something were to happen, you're covered. And like, you can't, you can't therapy your way out of that. You can't take a, an antidepressant out of your way out of that. And like, I'm pro those things, but doing that has allowed me to take more risks. It's taken away the stress of money. It's taken away the anxiety around money. And that is a huge stress. It's a huge anxiety for so many people. You may have great friends. You may have a great home. You may have a great physical health and all of those things. But if your money is bad, you are going to be stressed. It's just, there's no way around it. So for me, getting that together has empowered me to take risks. It's empowered me to start this business. It's empowered me to know that if I had to leave my job, I could leave my job and I don't have to worry about it. And if my car broke down, I don't have a car anymore. But if, you know, if, if things happen, if Logan had to go to the vet, like I'm going to be okay. And I am um, specifically this year, I've been seeing a integrated specialist for my health. And that's something that I could not have done if I was still living paycheck to paycheck, because it's extremely expensive. It's not covered by insurance. You're paying hundreds and hundreds of dollars of every month on seeing one doctor and seeing multiple different specialists, there is peace of mind knowing that, yeah, does it suck? I hate spending the money. I still don't want to spend the money, but like, I know I'm covered and that's not something I could have ever done before. And it's shitty. Like we should not live in a country or a time where in order to have good health and in order to have these things, you have to spend money. You have to have money. Like that is so messed up that that is how it is in our country or in the United States. But at the same time, because it is that way, we do have, like when we have those finances in place, when we have that emergency fund in place, when we have the means to do it, it's such a peace of mind knowing that, yeah, it sucks. I don't want to spend this money, but I can. And it's, I'm in a privileged place because I have put these things in place for myself. Well, and thank you for sharing that. I think that's so important for people to know. And I hope with making these conversations more open, even just through what you and I are doing right now, we eliminate at least some of those feelings where people uh, feel the embarrassment to just even have that conversation or talk about their finance in an open manner, whether it's at home or with their friends or publicly, you know, because there are so many people that are in that boat. Like statistically, North America overall, there is so many people. And even during COVID, it really exposed it that so few people had an emergency fund. So few people are well-equipped 
to go for an extended amount of time without their current job, right? Without the, without their employment. So it's raised these issues uh, and made them even more clear, even if, if they were hidden a little bit before. So hopefully, um, this all of this moves um, the needle in the right direction, you know, and, and where yeah, it is. Absolutely, because it's just we don't live in a country where we're taken care of. We have to take care of ourselves, and that's the thing that is a huge mind shift. It's it's something that it would be nice if we had a country that cared about the people who live here, but it's just not the reality. Like everything is on us. Our retirement is on us. Whether or not we go to college is on us. Whether or not we're able to put food on the table most of the time is on us. Whether or not we're able to keep our house is on us. You know, there are some programs out there that are available, but for the most part, it's our responsibility. It's scary. It sucks, but it's also empowering in a way because it's like, okay, I have to do these things. I have to figure these things out. I have to get my finances under control. You're right. And the faster we realize exactly that is the faster we stop making excuses and the faster we, we say, no, it's on me, right? And I can't really blame anybody else. That is the reality, right? Like crying about it won't really do anything, but I have to take certain steps. And thankfully, thanks to people like yourselves, there are some practical advice and blueprint available for people to follow, right? So in the past year, your blog has been doing well. You're getting more and more followers. Do you feel like it's turning from a hobby into a business? Talk about that entrepreneurial journey that, you, that you've been on. It's every side business owner's dream for their side business to turn into their full-time gig. For a really long time with Clover, I didn't really know how to monetize it because I was so focused on the personal growth space and I was focused on mental health. But when I started talking strictly about money, I don't really talk about mental health all that much anymore. I talk about mental health in relation to money, but all of my blog posts are still up there. Like you can still read everything that I used to write about. As I figured out my mental health struggles and my relationship struggles and things like that, I was no longer compelled to write about those things because they weren't present in my life anymore. For a while, I thought I was going to shut down Clobear because I didn't feel drawn to talk about those topics anymore. And I didn't really think I could pivot into anything else. And I kept thinking about, you know, what are, what am I passionate about? What are things that I really care about? And I just kept coming back to personal finance and I had no idea if personal finance was something I would ever be able to monetize. I just knew that I wanted to use the blog to keep myself accountable for it. But as I went on and as I followed other influencers in the space and other people who are writing about it, I was like, huh, I could really do something with this. Like I could keep creating content and eventually, you know, either through a YouTube channel or some other way, I could make money just from the content creating side, but I could also start offering courses and classes and workshops and things like that. And I love doing that. I've, I'm an educator at heart and I, you know, I used to teach English in China. I love teaching. I think that it's education is so important and an education in a way that's easy to understand. Like there are good teachers, there are bad teachers. And like I, I'm one of the good teachers and I know that. So it's like, it's one of my strengths and I, I am aware of that. So um, like, I, I understand the importance of it. And so going into the money space, I was like, oh, this is an opportunity for me to use this skill. It's an opportunity for me to teach people. And it's so important. It's something that I resonate with so much. But I was not thinking of starting financial coaching when I did a year ago. The way that it happened was I am connected to somebody here in Chicago. Her name's Saya Hillman. She owns Mac and Cheese Productions. And it's an event company, but it's like excursions, it's experiences, it's all of these different things that she does. And I had attended one of her cross it off days where you go in and you literally just co-work together for several hours. It's like a day dedicated to getting things done. We started following each other after that. And she saw all of my posts about, you know, sharing my budget. That was it. I was just sharing my budget at that point. And she's like, I think that you have a skill that you should be teaching people. Do you want to do a class for one of my events? Like you want to do an event with me? And so... I did a, I can't budget class. And from there people wanted coaching. And so I like, I scrambled and put together a coaching opportunity. I was like, okay, I'm going to need a form. I'm going to need some way to accept payments. I didn't have an LLC. I didn't have anything at that point. I didn't even have an agreement. I was just like, yeah, sure. Then right. mommy, I'll teach you like, we'll, we'll figure it out. And so I just fell into it in June of last year. I knew it was something I wanted to do eventually, but instead the opportunity presented itself. And I said, yes. And I was like, okay, I'll figure it out as I go. Am I, am I ready for this? Probably not. Am I, you know, set up for this? Absolutely not. 
but I made it happen. And so now a year later, I'm like, okay, I should probably start formalizing some of these things, you know, like not just relying on Google forms, like actually getting a CRM in place and things like that. But I incorporated into an LLC last year, like a few months after I started. And, you know, I've got some processes in place. I have some things that are actually working, but I was not expecting it to turn into a business as quickly as it did. And now I've definitely see the potential for growth. It's just, you know, finding the time to monetize some of the things that can be a full-time so that it can be a full-time business business eventually. So the goal is definitely to make Clover my full-time gig. Uh, I'm lucky that right now my job does allow for me to do both. Um, but I think that once I have my CFP license, I'll probably be able to take Clover full-time and I'm definitely looking forward to that. So we'll see what happens over the next year. That sounds so incredibly exciting. And as a passionate entrepreneur myself, I can relate to some of the things you're saying. So I, I'm excited for your excitement. I was curious about how your current employer looks at the situation. Um, oh, they don't they know. Said the <laughs> oh, they don't know. I thought no, you said they so know. My boss knows. I'm very close to my boss. She and I, I followed her from my last company. And some of my coworkers know about Clover, um, but my name's not like Chloe Daniels is not on it. So when people search Chloe Daniels, Clover usually will come up, but it'll be, you know, down in the search results. Whereas when you Google Clover, Clover comes right up. I don't talk about it at work. I don't share. I have a separate LinkedIn for Clover. I try to keep it separate. I think my CEO, he knows that I've done court, like I've done workshops and things like that before, but I don't think he has any idea, you know the extent of it and how much money I'm making from coaching and that it's like an actual business. So that's been good. And I plan to keep it that way until the day comes that I quit and say, I'm going off on my own business. <laughs> All right. Well, we won't but reveal luckily, you. Yeah. Luckily they're very separate. You know, I, I do communications and marketing in the engineering industry and then financial coaching is very different. There's no conflict of interest there. So All right. Well, we won't, we won't reveal anything uh, that, that shouldn't be, <laughs> but I can tell you if you continue going the way you are, it's just a matter of time until they're going to all know about it, right? Like <laughs> their, their nieces and nephews are going to be showing them their, this TikTok program that they just rolled into and it's yeah, going to be you. And they say, wait a minute, I know this girl. Dancing woman, isn't that our director? <laughs> <laughs> it's going to happen, Chloe. Uh, we'll see. That would be really funny. I mean, like I said, some people know about it, but it's not talked about widely. So yeah. Um, <laughs> I'll be honest with you. I, I think that that is something that's going to be shifting w within co corporations as well, because in general, side hustle entrepreneurship, it, it's very hot right now. Mm -hmm. And not only that, but it's, uh, it's, it, it, it extracts people's skill sets even more so. And I think that companies should be looking at it as an asset rather than a risk or a liability, because there used to be a time where like, yeah, no, you can't have any part-time jobs even or things like that. But today, and I can tell you, we run a business as well. We work with lots of freelancers. And we look for people that are doing things on their own too, because it speaks a lot about their character. It speaks about, about their drive, speaks about their passion, speaks about their level of engagement, speaks about, uh, speaks about how they mind things. And they're the ones that also come to us with new ideas uh, and uh, that we would have never thought about uh, on our own. So I think that maybe right now people are still reluctant to expose some of these things, but in the future, I think it's an employer's best interest to not only, you know, not penalize it, but reward people that take time and passion and materialize yeah. it outside of work. I totally agree. I think that it shows that you, when you are an entrepreneur, you have an entrepreneurial mindset. And that mindset is just so different than not having it. It's, you are, like you said, you're thinking of new things. You're thinking of ways to monetize things. You're thinking of creative solutions to problems. And you're putting forth extra effort. People who are willing to do a side business are people who are going to be some of the hardest working people that you know. Like there's that quote of, if you need something to get done, you find a busy person, you ask them to do it because busy people are the people who are getting a lot of things done. And you know, I agree. I think it is an asset. The truth is, I think that a lot of times companies and executives there are afraid to mm -hmm. hire people like that because they see it as a risk where you're going to spend as a company perhaps multiple years investing into that person, paying this person's salary, you know, investing into them, which is expensive. And then it's just a matter of time until they leave uh, to pursue their own, you know, career, to pursue their own blog or whatever ideas they had. But the way that I look at it is that in situations like that, those are rare cases where you're not just getting an employee, but you're getting a potential future partner. So if I were to hire somebody like yourself before you start your blog, 
And then you decide to go ahead and start your blog. It grows. It becomes huge. You're like, hey, Vlad, I'm done here. I want to move on. I'm going to say, wait a minute. Let's talk about this. You're a business person now. How about we sponsor your blog? Right. How about we work out a, a way to work together where it's a mutual win-win situation? Where yeah, you're getting all your true. dreams or we're getting even more benefit out of you now because look, you just built a whole separate asset that yeah. we kind of have first dips on if we could because we know you and we can talk right. to you. Right. That's such a great perspective to have. I love that. <laughs> well, um, Chloe, you you've shared some incredible insights with us, some really practical tips and information. Is there anything else close to your heart that you would love to share with people that may be watching this, that they're maybe curious about, hey, maybe I should start doing something about my money? I think that the biggest game changer for me is just having a bias towards action. Like instead of just thinking about it and thinking about it and having that analysis paralysis, like just do something, do the one thing, start the budget, track your money, decide to start investing and figure it out as you go. Because ultimately the best way to learn is to just do it and then figure it out later. Like most of what I have done in my life that has been successful are things that I just started. I had no idea what I was doing when I was budgeting. I had no idea what I do, was doing when I started investing. I had no idea what it was to be a private money lender. I had no idea all of these things. Like, yes, you should research those things. Yes, you should spend some time educating yourself, but there has to be a point where you decide I'm going to stop educating myself and I'm going to just start doing. Like I got to start doing the thing instead of just thinking about the thing. So for me, that's the biggest game changer and a, the biggest mindset shift of like, okay, yeah, I'm going to spend some time researching this, but I'm going to also just do it. That's tremendous advice, Chloe. And thank you very much for that. If our viewers and listeners want to learn more about Bear, your personal coaching program, or just in general, learn more about personal finance, uh, what's the best way for them to do that? Yeah, so I am the most active on Instagram. So you can find me at Clobear Money Coach. Um, that's C L O B A R E Money Coach. Um, and then I'm on TikTok too, the same t handle. And then everything, links to everything can be found at clobear.com. Thank you so much once again for taking the time today. And I also want to thank you for your mission and for continuing to spread the word about financial literacy, financial education, inspiring positive action. I um, really appreciate you doing that. I'm excited to watch your journey for years to come. And I want to thank you once again and wish you a wonderful rest of the day and rest of the week. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure.